Hey everybody. Uh, I don't really have uh, much at the top except to uh, to announce that the secretary will be traveling to uh, Paris, France tomorrow evening. Uh, while in Paris, who will be meeting with uh, President Abbas uh, to obviously uh, talk about um, uh, prospects uh, towards helping us uh, create conditions for a two-state solution. Uh, it, uh, it, there, there is a possibility that there could be additional uh, bilateral meetings uh, while we're in Paris, of course, and as we have more information about his schedule, we will be certain to provide it to you. But uh, the, the primary purpose is, uh, is a meeting with uh, President Abbas. The Secretary will return to Washington, D.C. on Sunday. And with that? Is that just a quick thing? The, you said he's going to travel t tomorrow evening. Um, will the meetings be uh, on Saturday then? Yes. Okay, and when you say additional bilats, um, is it the French or is there any possibility of a meeting with Israeli Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu? Uh, again, I can only tell you there's a possibility for uh, additional bilateral uh, meetings, and I don't have details on those to, to read out to you today. As soon as uh, we uh, have better clarity on the schedule, we'll, we'll give you that information. And just simply stated, can you give us a sense of what is the purpose of meeting with President Abbas? Well, I, I think I sort of addressed it in my opening statement. It's the, to continue discussions that we have had uh, with President Abbas about prospects for a two-state solution and trying to uh, make meaningful progress to create the conditions uh, where that, uh, you know, where that solution can be more successfully pursued. And you think there's a, that's actually, sorry, you think that's actually possible between now and the end of the year to create the conditions where that solution can be more meaningfully The, the Secretary is not looking at trying to make progress based on a, a fixed date on the calendar. I mean, this is something he's been focused on since he's been the Secretary of State and, and will remain so for, I, I can assure you, the entire time that he's in office. Um, and uh, he, you, you've heard him speak to this many times yourself here recently, and of course you've seen the travel that he's made to the region. Uh, this remains a, uh, an area of prime focus for him, um, and he's going to pursue it with the same alacrity and the same energy that, that he has. Right. There's, I'm, uh, you know, you say he's not focused on any particular date, but he is surely focused on the date of January 20th, 2017, when he will cease to be Secretary of State. He has less than six months left to try to advance this, and I'm asking if you think, if he thinks that meaningful progress can be made to create the conditions so that this can be fruitfully pursued in, in, in those six months or, or, or is, you know, or is, or is he really doesn't. Oh, of, not of think course he possible. believes that there's a, that, that there's, uh, the possibility exists. He, he wouldn't be having these discussions. He wouldn't, uh, think it was important enough to go and have this meeting if he didn't believe that, uh, that there was still a, a chance to make meaningful progress. May, may I, I think just to, put a finer point on what Arshad is saying is, is he trying to just continue to move this along, as you're saying, until the day he leaves, with just the um, desire to leave it in the best possible shape for his successor? Or is this part of a effort to try and get something meaningful in terms of negotiations or some kind of understandings before he leaves office. I think it's a genuine, concerted effort, as it has been since he's been the Secretary of State, to move the process forward, to, 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 to make progress on, on creating those conditions where a two-state solution can be realized. But, I mean, again, I'm just going to re repeat where I, I think you know where I'm coming here. Is he trying to just continue to improve the situation so that his successor can pick it up, or does he you know, honestly think that between now and then there's an opening for something tangible um, other than just improving the climate for the next administration. Well, look, ultimately, the, the, the real decision makers here are there in the region. Uh, President Abbas, Prime Minister Netanyahu, they're really the ones um, that can make or break any movement towards a two-state solution. To negotiations together that could have some kind of, no, obviously there won't be a complete and final peace deal before he leaves. There's just doesn't seem to be that kind of space or climate. But is he trying to get some kind of process restarted under his watch? He would like to get us to a, a position where 
you can actually make meaningful progress towards a two-state solution, and he's not going to give up on that goal. I'm, I'm not in a position, nor he, would he, to predict uh, uh, exactly on what time frame that could happen. But if you're asking, is he just trying to uh, hold down the fort here until he's done? Hold down or, the fort. I did not or, say hold down the fort. I said continue to tr hold down the fort would be to just manage it. I understand and am acknowledging that you're saying that he's trying to continue to improve the climate. But is that just an issue? Is is that trying to lead to something where he would restart what he was doing, you know, earlier in the term? I, I'm not going to predict specific outcomes. At least he's committed to this. He believes that there is still meaningful progress that can be made, um, and uh, he's not putting a, 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 a deadline or a timeline on it. It is, uh, it is an issue of great importance to him. He still has the same sense of urgency about it. And it's with that same sense of urgency that he is that he's going to continue to pursue these discussions. Can I change the subject? Sure. Um, last night, Vice President Biden called Vladimir Putin a dictator. Now that is a very specific word, you know, used for, you know, the roguest of rogue states. In the past, it's been used for President Assad, Pres uh, Muammar Gaddafi, North Korea, Saddam Hussein. Um, is it an official position of this administration that Vladimir Putin is a dictator? I'm not in a position to characterize the, the or further characterize the, the vice president's statements. I think they speak for themselves. Well, was he speaking on his own behalf, or was he speaking? He's the vice president of the United you... States. So, I mean, you know, as and you're speaking as the vice president of the United States. What I can tell you is our focus here is, uh, Would you is much less on. Uh, uh, a, a, a title one way or the other, and more on working with Russia to try to achieve progress on very difficult issues like Syria. I understand that. And I mean, you've worked with dictators in that regard anyway. So it doesn't, I'm not saying that would preclude you working with um, Vladimir Putin on Syria or not. Would, from this podium, are you prepared to call Vladimir Putin a dictator? I, I'm not going to, uh, 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 I'm going to let the vice president's comments speak for themselves, and I'm, I'm not going to So are you saying that he's speaking on behalf forward. of the administration when he calls Vladimir Putin a dictator? He's the vice president of the United States, at least. A, a yes or no answer would be great. I, I, you would have to talk to his staff in, in terms of you know, further clarification or, or qualification Because the Russians are comments. very, because, you know, obviously there's a lot of barbs being traded back and forth between the U.S. and Russia. But, you know, Russia is taking particular umbrage with, you I know. I would point you to the Vice President's staff for comments about his speech. All I can tell you is that the Secretary remains focused on trying to work with Russia on issues where we think we can work with them on. And that obviously includes Syria, uh, and uh, it obviously includes get, getting more progress on, on the Minsk agreements. That's where the Secretary's head is. That's where can his we, head is. Can we, Turkey, can we stay with Syria? Oh, I, I think let's stay with Syria, and then we'll go yeah. on. Yeah. Um, Syria. Yeah. You were on Syria too? Yeah. All right. Well, let me go to Arshad on to you. Okay. Um, Syria, the leader of Syria's Nusra Front, says that it is breaking ties with Al Qaeda. Um, do you still regard, uh, they've also adopted, a, they say they've adopted a new name. Do you still regard the group by another name as a terrorist, foreign terrorist organization? And from your point of view, are they still? Uh, uh, a legitimate target in Syria? Well, look, Arshad, uh, th this, this uh, uh, alleged announcement here uh, of their new name and potentially new affiliation is, what, minutes old here. So um, uh, I think, as you well know, we judge any organization, uh, including this one, uh, much more by its uh, actions, its ideology, its goals. Um, uh, the affiliations may be a factor, but ultimately it's their actions, ideology, and goals that, that matter uh, the most. And that's how we're going to judge uh, going forward, as we have in the past. Um, certainly, uh, thus far, and again, this announcement is, what, less than an hour old, we certainly see no reason to believe uh, that their actions uh, or their objectives uh, are any different. Um, and they are still considered uh, a foreign terrorist organization. Ha have there been any um, messages sent to the administration or to your interlocutors, whether it's in the Arab world or 
um, Stefan Dimastora in this vein that along with this affiliation could come um, some kind of more moderate position that they'd be interested in? No. I mean, again, they, they just made this I understand, announcement. but they so didn't just the, do the, it out of a hat. Like, obviously, it's something that's been considered for, you know, they didn't just wake up this morning and say, we have a new name. Well, this is obviously... And been... you have more insight into their thinking than I <laughs> well, do. Well, I mean, I it don't didn't know. just come out of thin air. I mean, obviously, this was a, a considered decision of, of at least 24 hours, I think. You'd have to so ask them. So I'm just always. wondering. Have there you... has been no communication that I'm aware of that would that that would indicate any sort of a different approach uh, to this group at this point. This announcement just got made, and again, we judge an organization by its actions, its ideologies, its objectives. And, uh, and what in, if we've it seen were nothing to that would moderate? Change our views at this point. And what if it were to moderate its um, actions and you know just focus more on this uh, on the Assad regime and not um, the Syrian moderate opposition. It's a terrific uh, hypothetical that I would be absolutely, it would be impossible for me to try to engage in. Well, would you, would it not be a good opportunity to encourage them to do so? If, the, given the fact that they're breaking with the world's most... You mean they need more encouragement than the, than, than, than the fact that they have been targets of kinetic strikes? That's no, fine. obviously that's probably, that's, I mean... That would be, I would hope, discouraging. Um, so I know, I, look, I can't predict uh, what this means. It just happened, uh, or, or what it portends for the future. It could very well just be a rebranding technique. Um, so we just have to, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. And as I say, we, we judge a group by, by what they do, not by what they call themselves. Uh, and so we're, you know, and, and thus far, there's, there's no change to our views uh, about this particular group. The way that uh, Jelani describes the new, well, the same group, new names, objectives sound very similar to that of ISIL. Does that give this government pause? The new objectives that they've stated? Yes, in this uh, video that uh, they're going to basically uh, stand up for the rights of Muslim people around the world. They're going to claim territory. They're going to act on their behalf, God willing. They, they have given us pause. I mean, more than pause. As I as I've said, they have, they have uh, because they are a foreign terrorist organization, they have been outside the cessation of hostilities. In the last hour or so since this announcement has been made, we certainly see no indication that would give us reason to change the designation of this group. Again, they're, you, you judge an organization like this on their, their goals, their ideology, their, uh, their objectives. And in that uh, same vein, uh, the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Mr. Rybakov of Russia, is still alleging, as of a couple of hours ago, that the U.S. still has not distinguished between terrorist groups and moderate opposition as part of trying to negotiate some sort of cooperative deal between the U.S. and Russia on fighting ISIL inside Syria. I take it then that uh, you dispute his uh, characterization. Yes, I would. I would. What is the uh, status of uh, trying to reach that agreement? I'm, I'm that, not uh, going to, as you said, look, I'm not, I, I, we've said we're not going to talk about the, um, the specifics of the proposals uh, that the United States and the Russia and, and Russia have agreed to uh, pursue here to try to better enforce the cessation of hostilities. Um, and, uh, uh, and the reason why I'm comfortable disputing a notion that that's, we've somehow been less clear here about groups is that it isn't just about the United States. It's a, the international community, the ISSG, the UN, all have agreed that, uh, that UN designated foreign terrorist organizations are outside the cessation of hostilities. And those are the only groups that are outside the cessation of hostilities. And to date, that has included obviously Daesh and Al Nusra. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not just about the degree to which we've been clear, it's about the degree to which the international community has been clear. And going back to uh, Nusra or Fath al-Sham, as they're now calling themselves, what is being done to try to ferret them out, if I can use that expression, as the coalition is trying to help the Syrian opposition go after ISIL, go after the regime, whatever it is that's happening on the ground right now inside Syria? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by ferret them out. All right, that was a cute way of saying of trying to kill them. There's been no change to the fact, again, that they just made this announcement like an hour ago, right? Right. So but the fact was that even before they decided to change their name, they were still, you know, they're in Man Beach, 
you know, fighting, you know. They're still a designated they're, they're, they're still organization. They're right. still not a party to the cessation of hostilities and therefore are still um, uh, a, a fair target for coalition operations. But given that they're fighting in the same neighborhoods, on the same streets, with people that the U.S. and other members of and the I, coalition uh, are... Excuse me, I want to correct what I said. Not a fair target of coalition operations. The coalition is going after Daesh, but they're still... Right. They're still uh, they're still uh, legitimate targets for uh, the United States. Yeah, for the United States, uh, and of course for Russia, which has a military presence in Syria. So I want to correct that. Yep. So how does the so how does then the U.S. try to go after them, or try to support the moderate opposition as it's fighting ISIL? You know, how do you how do you tease all of that out? How do you not end up killing the wrong people, killing your own people. Look, look this is the, the fact that uh, the loyalties of some opposition fighters have shifted or shift, um, and that there has been an intermingling of sorts uh, with al Nusra is not a new problem. Um, and it has been a, a struggle. Some of that intermingling has been by design, as I said, because some loyalties have shifted among members of these groups, and uh, some of it has been um, uh, coincidental. But it has complicated uh, 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 efforts to better and more effectively target uh, al-Nusra. Uh, that is one of the reasons why, quite frankly, the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov have spoken at length about trying to get uh, some proposals in place to move forward uh, uh, to better be able to enforce the cessation of hostilities, which this group is still outside of. Um, but I, 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 I'm loath to get into specific military targeting and intelligence issues from this particular podium. I mean, it remains, it has remained a, a problem. Uh, it remains one uh, today. And th again, that's why uh, it was so important for the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov to have that discussion in Moscow a couple of weeks ago. And finally, given that uh, the top leadership of Al Qaeda put out audio messages indicating that they supported. Nusra's move to change its name and make itself a distinct organization. What does that say to you, if anything, about Al Qaeda's overall influence on other extremist groups around the world? Look, Al Qaeda core leadership has been decimated. Uh, we know that, and we've talked about that many times. Um, uh, still, obviously, um, uh, remains a lethal terrorist uh, organization with. Uh, still lethal capabilities um, uh, with designs um, to attack Western targets and uh, to try to improve the, its influence. So we're very mindful uh, of the threat still posed by uh, al-Qaeda. I don't know what this announcement, yet one hour old, means in terms of al-Qaeda's influence one way or the other. Um, and as I said, we judge an organization by what it does, by its goals, by its objectives. Uh, not by the the, the name. Um, so I, I think we, we're just we're, we're going to have to to watch this as it as it goes forward. But there's been again no change to our approach to this particular organization, regardless of uh, of the the new brand that they uh, that they claim to be under. Turkish media are quoting Ambassador Bass in a speech saying that Gulen. I'm sorry, go, uh, Syria. Go ahead. No, it's just our tradition to try to go through okay, one topic sorry. if we if we can. I'll come back. Yes. Yeah. A couple more things on on Syria. Um, the Russian defense minister today said that the Russian and Syrian militaries will start a large scale humanitarian operation in Aleppo, uh, during which uh, civilians and militaries militants, excuse me, will be given a chance to leave the city. Um, did the Russians coordinate this with the United States? Did you know this was coming? I'm not aware of any uh, coordination. We've seen, uh, you know, we've we, we've seen uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, announcement, um, and I would tell you that um, it. Uh, hang on a second. Without further clarification, uh, this appears to be uh, a demand for the surrender of opposition groups and the evacuation of Syrian civilians from Aleppo. Uh, in any offensive actions, 
would be inconsistent with the spirit and letter of uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 2254 and our own understandings with the Russians. Our position on humanitarian access has not changed. Russia and the regime must uphold the basic agreed principle that the UN determines what assistance is necessary to relieve the suffering of civilians in besieged communities, and all supplies, including food and medical supplies, must be delivered immediately. So you don't see this as humanitarian at all. You see this as basically an effort to get the militants Again, to Again, without up. further clarification, this would appear to be a demand for the surrender of opposition groups and the evacuation of Syrian civilians from Aleppo. What needs to happen is the innocent people of Aleppo should be able to stay in their homes uh, safely and to receive the humanitarian access, which Russia and the regime have agreed, uh, in principle have agreed, certainly according to the UN Security Council resolution, to provide. Is that another way of saying that you think this is a way of the, for the Syrian government to just try to win Aleppo for itself once and for all? I, I think I've, I've, I think I've responded to the, to the answer on this. Again, without further, further clarification, it, it appears to be a demand for the surrender of opposition groups and the forced evacuation of, of uh, innocent Syrian civilians. Would this move be going against the steps that they agree to, to work towards a further military cooperation? It goes against the UN Security Council resolution and their own stated commitments. I'm not going to detail the, uh, the proposals that Foreign Minister Lavrov and Secretary Kerry had agreed to in Moscow as those proposals are uh, are still being, uh, the modalities of those proposals are, are still being discussed. The Defense you Minister. Go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, the, that's what that means, right? The modalities are still being discussed of proposals it means that there's no agreement. The way they're going to be implemented and executed, or you have the, a general the understanding, are still being are still being discussed. But there were proposals agreed to. The defense minister, minister also spoke of sending experts to Geneva at the request of Secretary Kerry. Well, again, this is all part of. As I said, there's still modalities uh, of these proposals to be di be discussed, and uh, I believe that's what the defense minister was referring to. I'd have to let them speak to uh, what officials they're sending uh, to Geneva, but. Uh, but coming out of Moscow, Foreign Minister Lavrov and Secretary Kerry agreed that our teams would continue to meet and discuss and to get better, some better clarity on the modalities of how to actually implement these proposals. And that's what's happening. Go ahead. You had a question on yes. uh, Ambassador Bass? Uh, a couple questions. Um, Ambassador Bass is quoted by the Turkish media in a speech as saying that Gulen was responsible for the coup. So is that accurate? Also, uh, Turkish government officials are quoted saying that if Gulen is not extradited, it will have a serious impact on U.S.-Turkish relations. What is the response to that? The, first, the, the answer to your first question is no. He didn't give a speech, and he never said that. Uh, on the answer, in the answer to the second uh, question, um, uh, look, we've been very consistent here uh, in everything we've said uh, about uh, Mr. Gulen and uh, any potential for extradition, uh, that uh, that kind of a decision would have to be evidence-based. It would have to be uh, uh, properly processed uh, the way it is supposed to in, in coordination between the State Department and, uh, and the Justice Department. Uh, as I have indicated earlier, we are in receipt of some material, and that material is being analyzed right now. I don't have an update for you. Uh, and, uh, and it wouldn't get ahead of what is and can be a fairly lengthy legal process. Since your comment yesterday uh, characterizing Turkey, we now have uh, official confirmation that more than 130 Turkish media organizations have been shut down. Is, uh, the question was asked yesterday, I think, by Arshad or somebody. Do you still consider Turkey a democracy, considering the thousands of people in detention, tens of thousands of suspects and the, and the arrests of journalists and uh, 130 and 150 media organizations being shut down. Well, let me just address the media uh, piece of that. Um, we're obviously deeply concerned by the reports um, and we're seeking additional information from Turkish authorities. As you well know, and as I've said many, many times from the podium, the United States supports freedom of expression around the world. And uh, we have concerns when any country makes a move to close down media outlets and restrict this universal value. Uh, we expect Turkish authorities to uphold their assurances 
that the Turkish government will protect the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. The uh, Turkish officials also suggesting that uh, Erdogan, the Turkish president, wants to put the military under his direct control, not have it as a separate entity. Would the U.S. Uh, be supportive of such a move? which would require a change in the Constitution? Or does this uh, raise more concerns about his ability to uh, wield power and to uh, control more facets of the Turkish government? We've talked at length, Raz, about, um, uh, uh, about what's going on in Turkey. We've condemned the failed coup. We've made clear that we understand the Turkish government has a right and a responsibility, quite frankly, to their citizens to get to the bottom of this, to investigate it, and to hold those responsible for the coup to account. Uh, the President, Secretary Kerry, have also, uh, of course, uh, stressed the importance uh, to, to their Turkish counterparts of upholding democratic principles uh, the, and the rule of law throughout this process. I've also said that, uh, that I'm not going uh, to make it a habit from this podium of responding and reacting to, to every single decision. Um, uh, we've seen this uh, in press reporting, same as you. Um, and I would leave it to Turkish authorities to describe uh, the motives behind it. But obviously, uh, Turkey matters to us as a friend and an ally. Their democracy matters to us. Um, their success uh, as a democracy matters to us. And so as a friend and an ally, we're going to continue to stay in close touch with Turkish authorities as they work through this. Could, I'm guessing your question is also on this. Yes. Uh, Earlier, the Turkish administration announced that they will send Justice Minister and Interior Minister here for the extradition process. Do, do you know that visit is still happening? Or? I don't have any updates uh, on there on their, to, to, to give you, and I would point you to Turkish leaders to talk about their travel. And the last one. Uh, there are still a lot of cultural stories or theories regarding U.S. involvement, despite the fact that uh, U.S. About, about U.S. what? A U.S. involvement in the coup attempt. Uh, there are still a lot of stories every day, uh, headlines in Turkey. Uh, do you think that the government, Turkish government, is doing uh, to, to counter these messages, or do you think the uh, why do you think these uh, blames and accusations are still uh, continuing? Well, I, I couldn't possibly begin to to know the answer to that question. Um, the, the people propagating the false rumors uh, are the ones to ask. Obviously, we had no involvement in this, uh, and any suggestion otherwise is ludicrous. Um, uh, but why such a rumor would prop be, be still be propagated or still be able to find purchase over there, I couldn't begin to guess. Um, we uh, are not only an ally to Turkey, we're a friend, we're a partner. Uh, and Turkey remains a member of the coalition to, to counter Daesh. Uh, and uh, we value that partnership, and uh, as we've said all along, we're going to continue to look for ways to deepen and strengthen it going forward. President Erdogan is going to Moscow next week, and there are a lot of opinion pieces and speculations that Turkey is uh, getting closer to Russia, and there may be some tensions increasing between the U.S. and Turkey, as earlier question mentioned. Do you have any comment on Turkey's uh, getting closer to Russia, whether? Uh, look, I mean, as a sovereign nation, uh, Turkey has uh, every right to pursue bilateral relations that it believes are important and to improve and strengthen those bilateral relations that it chooses to improve and strengthen. Um, and so I'm not, uh, we're not, uh, wouldn't be in a position to uh, comment or qualify one way or another uh, President Erdogan's travel or his discussion with foreign leaders. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's his uh, right and responsibility. That's, uh, that's the right and responsibility of a sovereign nation. Uh, what matters to us is both a, a bilateral and multilateral relationship that we have with Turkey, multilateral through NATO, multilateral through the coalition to counter Daesh, and, of course, the bilateral relationship that we have. And, uh, and look, we've been uh, nothing but honest and open and forthright with you right here in this briefing room about is issues and things that happen in Turkey that, that, uh, that concern us. Um, we've also been open, candid, and forthright with Turkish leaders about those same issues, as well as, and this often doesn't get attention by you guys, but the, all, all the many ways in which we see eye to eye with Turkey on many things and the things that we try to work together on and try to advance. Um, and, and there's a lot of those, too. 
I understand that doesn't make headlines, but it doesn't mean that it isn't happening. And it doesn't mean that it isn't happening even today as Turkey works through the aftermath of this coup, uh, uh, because operations against Daesh continue. Uh, operations against Daesh out of Insulik continue. Uh, so there, there's, there's, as there always is, uh, in, in a consequential bilateral relationship like the one we have with Turkey, there is a wide menu, uh, an agenda of issues uh, to talk with them about. Um, that's certainly no less true, in fact, more true, I suppose, uh, if, you, if you want to look at it that way, in the wake of this uh, coup attempt. And that's why Ambassador Bass um, is working so hard uh, to continue the communication and the dialogue um, and to improve the mutual understanding uh, that, that he has uh, with his counterparts there in Ankara. Just following up on that, uh, there was a message put out by the U.S. consulate <clears throat> saying that there are protesters marching towards the Incirlik uh, demanding that it be closed. Is there any concern about what appears to be a growing march of protesters? I haven't seen that report, Abby, uh, so uh, I'm going to have to kind of go back and, and take a look at that. Um, uh, so without addressing a specific query about uh, a protest march uh, on Insulik, let me just say that, uh, again, we appreciate uh, Turkish support uh, for the coalition in terms of the use of, of, of the, the Insulik air base for uh, operations against Daesh uh, in Syria. As I said, those operations continue. Um, Turkish support continues, and Turkish leaders from President Erdogan right on down to the foreign minister in his conversations with Secretary Kerry uh, made it very clear that there were not going to be negative developments in, in terms of those efforts as a result of this coup attempt. And with the exception of some temporary loss of power, which we talked about last week, uh, they've been good to their word that there hasn't been a degradation uh, in coalition use of Insulik uh, or Turkish support for that use of Insulik. Uh, against Daesh in Syria. So again, I just don't know anything about this, uh, the, the protests, uh, uh, and I'd have to go find a little bit more out for you before I could answer specifically a question about that. Yes, ma'am? It recently emerged that the Iraqi government has just issued orders to make the Shiite militias, the Hasht al-Shabi, a formal part of the Iraqi army. Among many things, the number two in the Hasht al-Shabi, and the fellow who's in effect its head is a designated U.S. terrorist for the role he played in attacking U.S. troops when we were there and for his close ties to Iran's Revolutionary Guard. So I'd like to know, what is your view of this Iraqi decision to formalize the role of the Hashd al-Shabi? First thing I'd say is, and as I've said before, this is an Iraqi decision. Um, uh, Prime Minister Abadi has been clear and he's been consistent about trying to create a more inclusive force uh, to go after Daesh, in, both inside the Iraqi security force proper and in working with uh, popular mobilization forces. Not all of which, I might remind you, uh, are influenced directly by uh, the IRGC or by Iran. Um, and it is the government in Baghdad, the Iraqi government, uh, that is and should be making decisions about the degree to which these forces are factored into actual strategy execution on the ground. Um, uh, for our sake, uh, the only other thing I'd say, and again, we've made this clear before too, is that we support those, those forces working under the command and control of the Iraqi security forces. Uh, but it is up to the government of Iraq to decide on troop composition and on placement on the battlefield, and we're going to respect those decisions. What if I could? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, the Iraqi leaders, including Prime Minister Badi, have said that the Hashd al-Shabi should participate in the offensive to take retake Mosul, but others, like political leaders in in Mosul in the Mosul area, have said that's a bad idea. So, is that accepted? I mean, your your view on the Hashd al-Shabi participation in Mosul's liberation is it's okay if that's what the Iraqi government wants? It seems that's what they want too. What what I'm saying is that these are the, the composition of of forces on the ground, and I'm I'm you're getting me into military issues that I'm really not comfortable you know, uh, discussing in any great detail. So I would also ask you to. Uh, seek out my colleagues at the Pentagon, but what we have said consistently is uh, this is an Iraqi campaign strategy. It has been from the start, the whole issue of going after Mosul. 
Uh, we are supporting that. We're advising it, obviously, and, and we're helping. But it's their campaign strategy. And it's a strategy, oh, by the way, that they have already started to execute. And we have helped in some shaping operations in and around Mosul. But the composition of forces in the field, that's a decision for the Iraqi government to make uh, uh, and for Prime Minister Abadi, Abadi to make. Um, and he has made it clear that he's going to be as inclusive as possible, uh, but that he, w he intends to, and he has the right to, reserve for himself uh, the final decision uh, about composition in the field. Um, and so the degree to which popular mobilization forces, by any name or any affiliation, are used uh, in the campaign against Mosul, again, that's, that's for them to decide. Uh, and uh, our role is to support Iraqi security forces and the government of Iraq as they begin to, to well, they already have begun, but as they complete the job of defeating and degrading Daesh inside Iraq. Okay. Just going back to Turkey, I want to make sure I understand something that you said about Israel, like when you said there's been no degradation. Um, is what you are saying that the tempo of operations from Incirlik has not changed? It is as high now as it was before the uh, attempted coup? Obviously, when there was a temporary power problems, I think there was a momentary pause, and it didn't take very long for them to begin flying again. I'd point you to my colleagues at the Defense Department in terms of um, the actual tempo. When I said no degradation, I was talking strategically from a, uh, you know, a, a larger perspective. I have no idea. Uh, what the flights out of Incirlik are on a day-to-day -day basis. I suspect it changes every day based on the campaign and targets. Um, but I'm given to understand that, uh, that there's been no, uh, th th as I said, there's been no degradation to operations out of Incirlik now. Again, I, I can't point to every single mission. You'd have to talk to my Defense Department colleagues. And i got a couple others on Syria. Um, you said that, to the best of your knowledge, there had been uh, no uh, consultation by the Russians with the United States about um, uh, this uh, Aleppo operation. Um, what makes you, if they're not consulting you about things like that, and if you say that with, without further clarification, it appears to be a ruse, what makes you think you're likely to, to get a wider deal with them on Syria? Well, it's okay, a couple of things here. I wouldn't call it a wider deal. Uh, we have, and we did have uh, an agreement coming out of Moscow on a set of proposals uh, to better enforce the cessation of hostilities, such so that, and let's not forget, so that Special Envoy Dimastura can have the political space he needs to get talks resumed as early as we hope next month. Um, and. The secretary was, I thought, I I extraordinarily pragmatic in the way he described it, even that very night. Uh, he said, look, um, if these steps are implemented, and implemented in good faith, they have a real chance at seeing progress with respect to the political solution uh, in Syria. But if they're not, then, uh, you know, then uh, obviously we're, we're going to have to uh, reconsider where we are. Um, and so that's what's going on right now, Arshad. The, uh, our teams are discussing the modalities of these proposals and how to actually get them implemented. Um, and those discussions are, are ongoing. Uh, the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov talked about that process a little bit uh, out at the ASEAN uh, Regional Forum on the sidelines of it. Um, and we've now seen an announcement by their Defense Minister that they're sending additional uh, uh, senior officers uh, to join those discussions. Again, all that is positive movement, but, um, uh, but as the Secretary said himself, the proof's going to be in the pudding here. And whether or not these modalities can actually be agreed to and can actually be uh, effective. Um, now, on, on this, the cor corridors in, in Aleppo, again, uh, you're, I, again, I have no indication that there was any advanced cult consultation on this. Um, and as I said, without further clarification, which would indicate we didn't have clarification at the outset, um, uh, it does not appear uh, to be anything more than a demand for the surrender of opposition groups. So, uh, so it is deeply concerning to us, uh, this, this announcement. And one other thing, who's going to meet with uh, uh, General, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Gadjima Gomedov, who is the general whom 
uh, the Russian defense minister said would be going to uh, Geneva next week, and who's going to meet with uh, Gennady uh, Gadilov, who he said will be leaving. I don't. Uh, first of all, I can't verify that those are in, indeed yeah. the individuals that uh, Russia is going to send. The Russians need to speak for that. Um, there are, there are obviously. Uh, uh, teams from both our, our countries um, that are having these discussions, uh, and I, I, I'm assuming the expectation would be that these gentlemen would join uh, the Russian team in those discussions. I just don't have any more specificity in terms of agenda or who's in the room uh, at any given moment during the discussions. Do you, but are you guys, to your knowledge, are you planning to send any other senior officials from the U.S. side? I, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, additional. Uh, uh, officials that would be sent. And who's leading the talks from the U.S. side? Uh, it's uh, um, certainly um, our special envoy, uh, Michael Ratney, is involved in this, um, uh, uh, as is, of, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, Brett McGurk. But uh, I don't have a I don't have a roster of everybody that's that's that, that at, that's at these meetings. Yes, in the back there. Uh, Different regions. One, Venezuela, do you have any reaction or comment to the former uh, Guantanamo detainee that resurfaced in Venezuela? I, I've seen those reports, um, uh, uh, but I'm uh, uh, not in a position to confirm them. And do you have any comment on um, North Korea saying that the U.S. has crossed a red line and declared war? I, I think what I would say is the same thing we've said, that, uh, that it's time for the DPRK to cease rhetoric and to cease actions that only, uh, you know, serve to destabilize the peninsula and do nothing to uh, improve uh, the lives of the North Korean people. Okay. One more. Uh, Hillary Clinton emails. Do you? Um, do so you glad have... I asked for one. More. <laughs> I know. Um, you had stated that you had received an initial uh, batch of emails from the F or documents from the FBI that they had recovered in the course of their investigation. Are you expecting another uh, set another of documents? <laughs> uh, I, don't have, um, I, I don't have anything to s speak to today. We have received uh, um, a batch uh, that we're still going through. Um, I, I can't rule out that there won't be uh, additional documents uh, uh, given to us uh, by the FBI, but uh, I'm going to have. I just don't have any anything new to say on that. I mean, we we have we have received some that we're still going through. So you don't have a any numbers that you could say as far as pages that have been provided. Or uh, again, we're still going through the uh, the batch that was provided to us. And again, I just don't have more detail right now. Sure. Did you? And I don't know if you were asked about this, and I missed it. But um, there's a report that uh, a an American citizen of Bangladeshi descent. Uh, was uh, killed in Bangladesh. Uh, <clears throat> can you confirm that report? Uh, I have seen reports that a U.S. citizen was killed in a police raid in Dhaka. We understand that there's an ongoing law enforcement investigation to, uh, on the matter, and so I'd refer you to local authorities for more detail uh, on that. Really? So you can't even confirm that a U.S. citizen was killed? I can only confirm that we've seen reports that a U.S. citizen uh, was killed in a police raid in Dhaka. Um, uh, in, out. out of respect for the privacy of those okay. affected, we're going to decline further comment. Uh, one other one, um, or two other ones. China says it's pressing ahead with its own uh, 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 missile defense system. Um, do you have any views on that? And at the same time, do you have any views on China's statement that it plans to hold drills with Russia in the South China Sea? We're certainly aware of the statement uh, from uh, China's Ministry of National Defense. We continue to carefully monitor China's military moderniza modernization and to encourage China to exhibit transparency with respect to its capabilities and its intentions. We encourage China to use its military capabilities in a manner conducive to the maintenance of peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, now, as to the uh, exercises, we have seen their announcement of, of joint exercises. Um, and again, as as we've said many times, I mean, military is part of the obligation of national defense establishments are to, to exercise and to uh, um, and to try to improve capabilities. And um, uh, we do that. We do that bilaterally with many nations. China uh, has been invited, uh, as you know, to, to participate or was invited to 
to participate in, in uh, the recent uh, RIMPAC exercise. Some of our exercises are bilateral, some are multilateral, uh, and there's certainly, uh, uh, it's certainly to be expected that, uh, that China and Russia would also pursue multilateral or bilateral training opportunities. Um, uh, but just as we do for ourselves in our training exercise and operations, we would expect that those uh, that, that those exercises uh, comply with international obligations and international law. You don't think it raises tensions for them to do that in the South China Sea? The, the, the physical act of, of exercising doesn't, there's, there's no need for it to raise tensions. Uh, exercises and operations are meant to hone capabilities. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It really depends on the way it's conducted. And as I said, uh, uh, our expectation is that these exercises and operations, like ours, uh, would be conducted in accordance with international obligations and law. Thanks, Thank everybody.